Thank you, Pat. It's such an honor to be here celebrating our país's 10th birthday. Yeah. Um, I uh, always think about innovation when I think about our país. And of course, when you think about innovation, you always want to start looking at predictions, right? So here are a few that are my favorites. Less than 10 years before Kitty Hawk, Lord Kelvin predicted that nobody would ever be able to fly. Here's a few on computing that are my favorites. Popular Mechanics was going out on a limb saying that computers will someday weigh less than one and a half tons. And one of my favorites, 640K of memory ought to be enough for everybody. I would argue people under 30 don't even know what a K of memory is. So how could these absolutely brilliant minds be so absolutely wrong? In my mind, the answer is quite simple. A prediction is nothing more than an extrapolation of the past. Innovation changes everything. When Bill Gates made that comment, he couldn't imagine that it, we would all be wearing computers on our wrists and want to carry our, our videos and want to carry our pictures. That wasn't what he was saying when he was saying 640K is enough. He was trying to tell his coders, make the code tight. You don't need to waste in any memory. So that's what ARPA -E is all about creating something that we can't imagine today. Instead of helping to predict the future, they're helping us all create a future. And I would argue that we sit at a time when we absolutely have to create a new future for energy. We talk about greenhouse gases. We see what happens with single-use carbon, with particulates in the air or plastic in our oceans. We have to learn, in my mind, to recycle carbon, to stop thinking of carbon as a single-use disposable item. And so we really need to change the playing field. I like to think about recycling carbon in the way that I've shown it here, because by going from green to blue, it allows us to imagine a future that looks like this because removing particulates, removing pollution, is a bluing exercise, not a greening exercise. At Lancet Tech, what we do is we recycle carbon emissions. What we do is we have a bacteria that eats carbon monoxide, hydrogen and carbon dioxide, and converts that to ethanol. That's all it needs. Where can you find carbon monoxide? Many industrial sites emit carbon monoxide as CO2, and what we do is we capture that and we convert it to ethanol. The biomass in the bioreactor can be removed. It's growing and alive, and we use that for animal feed. We can take ethanol and convert it to jet fuel, and we can also make chemicals, all from these waste carbon emissions. You can also gasify biomass or municipal solid waste to get to carbon monoxide, which can be converted to ethanol. I know this sounds a little bit like science fiction, but it's not. This is a picture of our first commercial plant. It's operating at a steel mill. It uses carbon monoxide emissions from the steel mill. They come in in that green tube that you see, and they're converted to ethanol in our bioreactors. We started our first commercial plant last year, and we've already produced more than seven million gallons of ethanol. The technology works, the technology has scaled. We're building plants globally. We're also building one in, in Belgium with ArcelorMittal, in a refinery in India, and a ferroalloy plant in South Africa, as well as gasified biomass here in the US. These plants all rely on a variety of carbon-rich gases that would normally be wasted or underutilized. What I think is worth pointing out in a room like this is that we have partnered with US Trade 
to help us get some of these projects in other jurisdictions off the ground. By partnering with them, they've given us the credibility that we need to be able to grow uh, globally. And so we're very grateful for that. If we could use all of the carbon in these types of feedstocks, whether they be residues or whether they be industrial waste, we could make on the order of 500 billion gallons of ethanol. Okay, so that's way more ethanol than we need. And so I want you to think of ethanol a little differently. I want you to think of ethanol the way I think of ethanol. I believe that ethanol could be a substrate for making future products. If you think about it, I'm never gonna move a waste gas from an industrial site. It's very difficult to do that. You're not gonna move waste biomass, you're not gonna move MSW. But what you can do is convert that in remote locations to ethanol and then move the ethanol. It's an easy to transport liquid. And if you do that, then you can do all sorts of things with it. By working with the DOE and working with PNNL, we've been able to develop a technology that takes ethanol and makes jet fuel, ethanol and makes diesel. And in fact, we've already proven, we've made this jet fuel in a large enough scale that we actually flew on that fuel a commercial flight from Orlando to Gatwick on a Virgin Atlantic flight. So it is possible to do this, and ethanol was the feedstock. What else can you do with ethanol? Our entire chemical industry is based on ethylene. You can make polyethylene, PET, PVC, all of these things starting from ethanol. You just have to add an intermediate dehydration step. This, I think, is an important way of thinking about how to utilize residues. I guess at this meeting, it's probably worth thinking a little bit about what it takes to go from an idea to something that's a commercial reality and is being deployed in many parts of the world. So I thought I would comment on that. It takes a lot of data. <laughs> We built five different pilots and demos outside of our labs, over 80,000 operating hours outside of the lab. Why outside of the lab? Because if you're working with a bacteria, you want to make sure you don't have a lab prima donna. You don't have a bacteria that's gonna go out there, roll over, and play dead. So we had to take it out into the field and grow it there. The other thing we had to do, I think you all know, two points, always make a line. And so you want to make sure that you don't just do all your testing under the same conditions in the same environment. So we tested our technology out in a lot of locations. I think this is critical, but it's also why it takes so long to commercialize a new disruptive technology. And Lancetec's been at it for 14 years. This is our 15th year, and we just started our first commercial last year. I think you can do the math. If it takes that much data and that much time, it also takes a lot of money. And we've raised over $250 million as a company, which is what we've used to develop our platform, which has enabled this. I assure you we don't waste money. I assure you this is what it takes. And I think if we want to succeed at doing disruptive technology, we need to be prepared to invest in making that happen. The most important part, of course, is your team. We have created over 160 jobs in Chicago and in Georgia, and we're excited to continue to grow the team. And of course, I'm here <laughs> because we partnered with ARPA-E, and it really takes partnerships. I guess the best way to handle this is just to say what John Lennon used to say, right? With a little help of your friends. The reality is, this is really what it takes. There is no way a small company could ever scale, could ever commercialize a new technology by itself. All of these people have domain knowledge that we don't have, and they bring it to the table to help us scale up. And they're as committed to this gas fermentation vision as we are. A lot of people say that scaling a new process technology is a little bit like crossing the valley of death because every step is more expensive, every step takes more time. 
My husband actually says, Jennifer, you're not crossing the valley of death, you're crossing the Grand Canyon of death. And he's absolutely right. And I think when you talk about pushing the boundaries, this is really where ARPA-E can be of great help. It's not a case of funding, it's a case of having experts with a lot of knowledge help you and push you to develop ambitious technical milestones, which is super important if you really want to do something innovative and you want to do it quickly. And by the way, I think 14 years is super fast. That is not slow for something new and disruptive. So I want to tell you just a little bit about the project we've been working with ARPA-E. It was funded under the remote program and as you can see has quite a number of partners. The goal of this program is to be able to put our reactor system in a remote area, which means it has to be smaller, which means it has to be cheaper. And in fact, our goal was not small, <laughs> not 5% reduction, but 25% CapEx reduction. This is the kind of improvement that creates the ability to deploy the technology in remote locations. But the other thing it does is it allows you to, if you take 25% capital out of the basic technology, you can put 25% in somewhere else, okay? So for example, you can buy another piece of metal, an electrolyzer. And instead of using a CO hydrogen stream, all of a sudden you can use a CO2 stream to feed the same technology. Now you can afford it because you've taken other costs out. And as I'm sure you all know, electrolysis is becoming increasingly interesting because of the availability of low carbon power. And when I say cheap, if you go to places like Texas, sometimes it's negative priced. So all you're really doing is storing those electrons in a liquid by doing something like this. And this is gonna be an important part of the future. And I'll give you an example of a place where you could use something like this. Today, um, our farmers use corn to make ethanol. For all of the ethanol that's made, a third of all that carbon ends up as CO2. It's just a fact of fermentation of sugar. Now imagine if you could couple that with cheap electrons and electrolyzer and recycle all the CO2. Use the rest of the infrastructure, the rest of the distillation and water treatment and everything else at that site. You could go from a typical 80 million gallon plant to 120 million gallons of production. 100% of the carbon would be used none would be wasted. There's over 200 sites in the United States where you could do something like this. This is what I call really using carbon. This is carbon efficiency at its best, all enabled by ARPA-E. ARPA-E isn't just about funding an idea, it's about helping to fund the scale up as well. And we've worked with ARPA-E since 2014 to develop this concept and we're now in the field pilot test, testing phase. And we already have a path to a demonstration phase, but we first need to finish the pilot phase. And we've missed a milestone. We're a little bit off, not surprising. Tough milestones are there to be made and sometimes missed, but we'll get it. We'll get it done. It's better to set a hard milestone than an easy one. You'll always get the easy ones, so what? So this is, this is where we are. So back to the beginning, back to thinking about carbon recycling. A steel mill recycles its steel, but it makes carbon steel and there's some carbon that's wasted in the off gases. We can take that carbon in the off gases and reuse it to make ethanol for cars, convert that to jet fuel for planes. We've shown that works you can also start to imagine sequestering carbon in durable goods, recycling that carbon in those gases into tires or other things. I really believe that fundamentally the change that we need to make is we need to think of carbon as being part of the circular economy. Not things being part of the circular economy, but it's basic fundamental carbon level. I'm a chemist, so I'm <laughs> prejudiced. We have to go back to the fundamental level. I think this is really the future. I will leave you with a thought. 
I know all of you are working on things that are at least as hard as what I've talked about. And I know it's hard, and I know the road is a little long. So I'll leave you with a quote from Muhammad Ali. You struggle out of the sunlight, but when the time comes, and I guarantee you, all of your times will come, you'll be dancing in the stars. Thank you. Thank you.